Porch, how we doing? Come on, come on. I am so excited. I am sincerely so excited to be with you guys tonight. Um, this message, this scripture has really ministered to me. Even in preparing it for you and preparing it for this evening has really uh, ministered to me. And so let me just start with asking this question. Have you guys ever had to carry a bunch of chairs? You ever done that? If you've been to launch retreat with us, you know, we put out a thousand chairs. We got to collect a thousand chairs. And so you're loading them up, you know, the folding chairs, you're putting them up on that cart. And um, what that means is people spread out and they're, they're helping. So you've seen the scene where you're, you're folding up the chairs and you're, you're carrying them. And everyone carries, if you ever noticed, everyone carries like different amounts of chairs, you know, right? Okay, so there's like a, you know, like my, my, my 10-year-old daughter, she's got her and, and David Marvin, they each have one in each hand. And then you got Blake McJunkin, like big Blake. He, he's, he's carrying 27 chairs, you know, and just kind of walking up effortlessly and like setting them down. And everybody's got, you know, there's, everybody has different stacks. They carry them different ways. They can carry different amounts of chairs. And every now and then someone will drop them. Those aluminum chairs on that concrete floor, it's, it's loud. It's, it makes this loud noise, this big commotion. And the only reason anyone would ever drop the chairs is because they carried more than they were supposed to. They, they, they thought they could carry this many, but they didn't have a grip, and, one, and you know, one slips out, and it just makes this big commotion. Everybody turns around, stops with, the, what's going on over there? Oh, so-and-so dropped the chairs again. And I start there because it was a, it's been an interesting season for me, and I just want to let you in in my world a little bit, and uh, I, metaphorically speaking, I think I carried more chairs than I was supposed to this summer, and I had a, a friend really close to me, someone I love, got sick, and I started uh, stepping into their life and helping them and, and visiting doctors with them and going to appointments with them and, and uh, really, you know, bearing that burden with them, and I, I didn't realize how stressful and how difficult it was. And in, in the midst of speaking engagements, I taught it at several different camps and was traveling this summer. Summer's a really busy speaking time, and uh, I had taught, or I was scheduled to teach 25 times in six weeks, and, uh, and so that was kind of going on. And, and I signed a book deal. I'm writing a book uh, uh, to you guys, really. It's called Welcome to Adulting. And and, uh, and, and there were deadlines, and so the deadlines were kind of hanging over me, and so that was, you know, it's like I picked up another chair, and I picked up another chair, and I picked up another chair, and I didn't realize how many I had, you know? And uh, I went down to Austin, and I taught at a big church in Austin, and great opportunities, you know, I love to teach uh, the Word of God, love to share the gospel, went down there, taught three times, you know, back to back to back, and then I was on the road, I was driving back to Dallas in a large church on the West Coast called, one of the largest churches in the world, Rick Warren's church, if you know about it, I said, hey, can you come and, and speak uh, here, you know, next Sunday, next weekend? I said, man, I'd be honored, and, I, and so I came home, and I taught here, and then I got on a plane, and I, I flew to California, and I was sitting in my hotel room. I was laying in, in the hotel bed, and, and it was the night before I was teaching. The next day, I was, you know, it's going to be streamed to, to 13 campuses, 30,000 people, and, and I'm laying in bed, and I can't sleep. And I'm like, man, why can't I sleep? You know, I got to sleep. I got I to gotta teach. I got to teach tomorrow. I gotta, I'm going to be in front of 30,000 people. They brought in this, this silly guy from Texas, and I, I better have my act together, you know, and I better, you know, Lord, help me sleep, and, and when you try to sleep, you can't sleep, and, and I'm laying there, and I'm like, why can't I sleep, and I, I feel my heart just go boom, but up a boom, but up a boom, I'm like, something's not right, something's not right with my heart, my physical heart, like something's wrong, I can't sleep, something's wrong with my heart, I, I get through the night, I go the next day, I teach the three times I'm supposed to, and I get on a plane, I come back to Dallas, and I'm sitting in my house now, but ba boom but ba boom and it's like thunder beats in my chest, and I go to the emergency room, I'm like, hey guys, something's not right, and uh, 
hook me up to an EKG, all these machines and wires, and I say, yeah, yeah, I see some PVCs. I'm like, what are PVCs? Like pipes? What are you talking about? And, <laughs> and uh, they're like, no, premature ventricular contractions. Oh, man, that don't sound good. And, and so that's just something I've been dealing with and, and asking the Lord, honestly, to take from me. But in it, I see his extreme mercy. And I don't believe that you know, all health issues are caused by sin. Certainly don't believe that. That's a gross heresy. But as I look at my own, I can see a sin attached to it. And the sin that is attached to it is the sin of pride. And it's the pride of a savior complex, thinking that I'm the only one that can help somebody. And, and moving into their situation, and instead of allowing them to lean on their community, it's, it's the sin of finding identity and success and, and book deals. The, the sin of, of, of wanting you know, people to think much of me and not, not being able to say no, not wanting to say no, because every time you say yes, you're saying no to something. And I didn't realize that, and so I just kept saying yes, and kept saying yes, and going here, and flying here, and doing this, and, and thinking, man, this is all great. And, and before you know it, you start leaning on your own gifts, which is a sin, like just leaving God out of it and just kind of going over, hey, I do this routine, the sin of, of routine where he's like, okay, I'm going to step up there, I'm going to put a microphone on, I'm going to speak, I'm going to open the word, I'm going to teach, I'm going to give this illustration, and you're just going through these things, and I believe in my life it was the sin of pride, and pride is the grossest sin, the mother of all sins. In fact, C.S. Lewis says this about pride. Pride is the, he says, according to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity or being uh, unpure, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are, are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Pride says that I want to be like God. Lucifer in the kingdom of heaven fell from heaven with the fallen angels. He says, God, I don't want to worship you. I want to be like you. Adam and Eve in the garden says, God, we don't trust you. You say that that's not good, but we want to see what it is. We think maybe you're holding goodness from us. That's pride. It's the biggest struggle in the room today, and it's the biggest struggle of everyone listening this evening. And I believe pride, listen, pride is the source of your anxiety. If you find yourself anxious, I, I want you to trace it back to pride. I know that's not helpful. I know that's not helpful. I understand that when I say pride is the source of your anxiety, it doesn't help you be less anxious. But if it's true, I think we can find something helpful in that truth, especially in this verse we're going to be in. And so we're starting a new series tonight. I know it's the end of the year. This is the series that we will kick the year off. It's called Vice and Virtue. Vice and Virtue, where every week we will look at a vice and a virtue, the menaces and the marks of Christianity. And so tonight, the subject is pride and humility, the vice and the virtue, pride and humility as we dive in on this specific topic. And so there's some questions I can ask you to see if you struggle with pride. Are you anxious? Are you critical of others? Are you defensive when someone points out sin in your life? Do you justify, explain it away? Do you quickly notice pride in others? He's prideful, she's so prideful. Do you constantly seek out others' approval? Are you insecure? Do you take advantage of God's grace? Do you feel shame or think your sin or brokenness is bigger than God's grace? Do you believe that you are worthless or unforgiven? That's prideful. Does a particular, does a particular sin define you more than God's claims on your life? I believe this vice, more than any other sin, is robbing you of God's favor, his blessing, his joy, and his abundant grace. And if you fall into this sin, 
I'm warning you tonight, the chairs you're carrying, they are going to come crashing down. It is only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time before there's a big noise and a commotion around you. And at the base of it is pride. I'm going to be in 1 Peter 5. If you want to turn there in your Bibles or on your phones, I want to welcome those tuning in from around the world, especially our friends in Fort Worth this evening, our friends in Houston, and those that are, are joining the stream online through the app. In 1 Peter 5, I'll read the scripture to you, and before I do, I want you to know this has been a lifeline for me. I don't know that my heart's ever been more around a scripture that I've taught, because when that happened to me this summer, what I did is I took a dry erase marker and I wrote this on my mirror. And every morning and every night, I would read it to myself, this specific scripture. This is what it says. All of you, all of you, everyone, clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, from the Proverbs. God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself, that God, creator God, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now let me just show you something real quick. Consider if you've been in church for a while, how many memory verses are in this little section of scripture? Back to back to back. You ever heard this? Clothe yourself with humility. You ever heard God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble? You ever heard, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you? Have you ever heard, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour? All those verses are jam-packed right here in this little section of scripture, back to back to back. And they all seem like new ideas. I want to show you. I don't think they are. I think that they're tied together. And so as we move through this, we're going to look at how pride brings opposition, humility brings help. And before you leave here this evening, Peter, who wrote this to the persecuted church is going to tell us to put on humility, to put it on. And so it says, all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. My first point this evening is that pride brings opposition. That if you find yourself thinking a lot about yourself or better said, thinking about yourself a lot, you are going to find yourself marching against opposition. The opposition of God, the opposition of self, and the opposition of Satan. All of those forces will be coming against you when you begin to think about yourself too much. Now this is something that we do. When I say the opposition of God, it says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. It says that we're to put on humility. Here's what I would tell you. Just like you identify a team by their uniform, like if you're watching a game, you know who's playing by the colors that they're wearing, okay? You can see whether it's the Cowboys or the Mavericks or, or whoever it is based on the uniform that they have. When you wear pride, you are wearing the uniform of the other team. When I say the other team, I mean the team that is playing against God that you have the creator of the heavens and the earth working, actively working against you, the most powerful force in the world. So he says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And this verse reveals something very interesting and yet extremely unpopular. That the source of, of anxiety is pride. And the solution is humility. Now stay with me there. Don't let me lose you with just a, a band-aid statement like the solution is humility. We'll, we'll dive deeper into that. But consider this for a moment that the source of anxiety is pride. I, I know that doesn't feel helpful, but if it is true, then we can test it and I think it will prove to be helpful. Let's just consider testing it for a second. If there's something, if there's someone rather, and they are cared for by someone who is all powerful, 
They are in the care and the protection of someone who is all powerful. If that person feels absolutely loved and absolutely protected and absolutely provided for, can they be anxious? And yet if we take God at his promises, are we not absolutely loved, absolutely provided for, and absolutely protected by God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, that a sparrow doesn't hit the ground apart from his will? And then the struggle is, well, then I want to believe that, but how do I believe that more? How, how do I jump over that hurdle where I can take God as his promises, that I can believe upon those things? We're going to see in the scripture. The core of our anxiety is doubt of God's goodness, which is to say we know better about God's character than he declares. We begin to question, is he good? Does he love us? Can he actually ha protect us? Does he have the power to protect us? Anxiety is not a battle against something else but ourselves. And so this is the opposition of self. Pride brings opposition. If you can rid yourself of pride, you will in turn rid yourself of anxiety. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And it seems like such a new thought that he's just jumping, okay? God opposes the proud, you know, cast your anxieties on him. Hey, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. But they're not, they're not new thoughts. I think what Peter is telling us is that the things that we're anxious about are the playpen that Satan plays in. There's the fence. Like he knows what we're worried about. He knows what we're anxious about. And that's where he's going after. You're never going to get married. You're going to stay single. You're like, they don't like you. Hey, you're not going to make enough money. You're never going to make six figures. You might lose your job. He knows that. He's just there. Boom, boom. He's looking for the chinks in your armor, the gaps in your armor. And he's just shooting fiery darts right there. He knows where you doubt and your pride feeds that lion. Your pride feeds that lion. He feasts on those things that you trust in other than God. He feasts on the areas of your life where you don't trust God. And the, the ask, the command, is that you would starve him. He's a stray cat. He's a stray cat. He's a smelly cat. Phoebe from Friends would write a, a song about him, you know? <laughs> That, that's who he is, and he's just hanging around. And if you feed a stray cat, what's he gonna do? Oh man, give me some more. Give me some, oh yeah, I like that. Give me some more. I'm not going anywhere. If you starve a stray cat, what's he do? He leaves. Satan works like Netflix. Okay? He does. Netflix and Satan, they're one and the same. <laughs> Here, here's what he does, right? You know how Netflix works, right? Like, oh, oh, you like Friends? Oh, you watch Friends? How about Seinfeld? How about this? How about, oh, you, want, you like Stranger Things episode one or season one? How about season two? Season two just came out. Do you like season two? Oh, you like horror films? Uh oh, you like violence, huh? How about this violence? 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 Oh, oh, you are desperate to get married. Here's some romantic comedies to fill your tank. <laughs> watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. You see how he works? You, you feed him and he just starts putting things in front of you. You don't even realize that you're feeding the very struggles that you don't want, that those struggles are growing because their appetite's growing because you're feeding them one by one through a song, through a movie, through a video, through the things that you like, through magazines, through your Pinterest folder. You're just feeding them and they're growing. They're growing. Oh, oh, you like to, to look at people naked in the act of, act of sex. Oh, let me put that in front of you here. Let me put that in front of you here. Let me put that in front of you here. Let me put that in front of you here. Let me put that in front of you here. Do you see the lie of one last time? I'm gonna look one last time. I'm gonna do that one last time. And that appetite just grows. That's all you do is feed something. It's now harder to stop. I'm gonna do it one last time. No, you're not. You're gonna do it 2,000 more times because you did it one more time. Do what you did. You fed him. When I actively looked at pornography, speaking of pornography, 
it was interesting. It would pop up everywhere. I couldn't get away from it. Like there was, you know, I, I would, it was on my computers, on my hard drive. It, everywhere I go, boom, there it is, boom, there it is. Every, every billboard, every magazine, every, I, I'd sit in the grocery store, boom, it's in my face. Everywhere I turn, there's like pornography, pornography, pornography. And I thought I'll never get away from it. I, I'm going to be stuck here. I'm going to look at this for the rest of my life. And now after 12 years of sobriety, I realize that's not the case. That to see it today, it, it takes considerable work. It's something that I would have to seek out. It doesn't keep you know, tripping me up. It doesn't keep you know, popping up in front of me. And you say, well, how did you get to a place of recovery? I asked for help. I got to the end of myself and I thought, you know what, I can't defeat this thing by myself. I need help. I need someone to come in and help me. I need someone to save me from this thing that I'm feeding. I've, I've grown an appetite that is overwhelming. I need help. I need help. And I started asking for help. It's a position of humility. Recovery starts with humility. But your pride, it will keep you sick. I say, man, you can't tell somebody that. You can't ask for help. Oh, you asked for help once. You know, move on. You said something about it. You brought it up to community. They didn't do anything. Keep going. My second point from the scripture is that God helps the humble. He shows favor to the humble. He extends grace to the humble, your scripture may say, your Bible may say. My second point is that God helps the humble. See, I thought I'd be addicted to porn my entire life, but when I started asking for help, and not just asking for help, but finding a greater satisfaction in Jesus, I found recovery. Here's, let, me, let me make that tangible, finding a greater satisfaction in Jesus. I started being discipled. I started learning the Bible. I started doing all the things that you keep saying you're going to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. 2018, man, that's your year. You're going to join a church, going to get in community. You're going to memorize some scripture. You're going you're gonna to get a new Bible and, and read it every single morning. I know. I know. I started doing those things. I started feeding on sermons started educating myself to God's word and his commands. I started praying like my life depended on it, crying out to God, please help me, God. I want to stop picturing women naked, God. God, I'm perverted. Help me, Lord. And he did. He said, Here, here's what that looked like practically. Is I can remember driving home from work every day. There's this billboard on the, on the side of 635. That's a highway here in Dallas. And, and, um, and every day, you know, as I'd leave work, I'd drive by that billboard. And on that billboard was a woman in a bikini. And um, it was like an advertisement for some adult store underneath it. And, and every day I'd look at that. I'd lust for that every day. And and um, on this particular day, I'm in the car and I'm worshiping, you know, and I had left a Bible study and I had community that night and, and I had read the scriptures over lunch and, and I was surrounded by men who loved me and knew God and who knew me and loved God. And, and, and so I'm there in the car and it's me and Jesus and I'm talking to Jesus and I'm praying and I sense that that billboard's coming up because I'm driving down the highway and it's getting closer and it's getting closer. But I, it seems like, it feels like Jesus is in the car with me because we're talking, we're communing. He feels close to me. And, and as I get closer to that billboard, I, I, these words come out of my mouth all by myself in the car. It's not worth it. It's not worth this. Glancing up at that two-dimensional woman who I don't know is not worth sacrificing closeness to Jesus. So you got to ask every time, is a romantic comedy worth it? Is, is watching that one more time worth it? Is it listening to that worth it? Is going there with your friends worth it? One more drink, a shot, is it worth it? Is it worth this? Because the enemy's right there saying, feed me. I'm hungry, feed me. Feed me. Feed me. But when you're humble, God comes to your aid. We have one that protects us. We are protected under the hand of God. We know our place, that, that we're the ones that need protection, and we have a protector. It says, verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. David's, King David's go-to illustration, David and Goliath, David and Bathsheba, David the shepherd boy, David, his go-to illustration, his go-to metaphor for God was, the Lord is my, what? The Lord is my shepherd. 
The Lord is my shepherd. Now, David was a shepherd. He knew what this meant. And what he's doing is he's putting himself in the story. God is a shepherd. He is a sheep. Now, here's what's interesting about being a sheep. Sheep is the most defenseless animal in the animal kingdom. They've, they've got no claws. They've got no sharp teeth. They've got no thumbs. They've got nothing. They've got no nunchucks or nothing to protect themselves, right? They're sheep. They are sheep. They've got no crazy laughs, nothing. And so... All right, you know what happens when a sheep is scared? You know what happens when a sheep is scared? It falls over. True story. It's a sponge with sticks for legs. That's a sheep, right? And, and so here's the deal. You're a sheep. And if you think you're immune to pride, you're gonna be launched. Because there's an enemy, there's a lion. A sheep without a shepherd is launched. But a sheep with a shepherd is loved, protected, and provided for. And we have a shepherd. We come under his mighty hand. We humble ourselves with a constant renewal of our mind that there's a God, creator of the heavens and the earth, and we sit under him. We sit under his feet. We sit at his feet. We're under his hand. He's our protector and our provider. And as we come under his power, he lifts us up, it says. That he's the force behind us, pushing us forward. And it says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. What does it say? It says, throw your anxieties on him. Why? Why do I throw my anxieties on him? It's like, throw your anxieties. Like he's a coat rack. And you throw your anxieties on him. How do I throw my anxieties? Throw my anxieties on who and why and what? Because God loves you. Right now, like not later, not when you're not anxious. Like when you're anxious, he loves you. He loves you. Everything you've done, he knows and he chose you. You're like, how do I know he chose me? Look around where you're at right now. You're at church on a Tuesday night. You're not, you're not at, you know, $2 margarita bar or whatever, right? No, you're here. And it's not by chance. And I'm not saying because you're here, you're saved. I'm saying because you're here, he's pursuing you. And you need to come to the end of yourself and look up and say, God, I'm ready. I'm ready. I need your help. He loves you. And we're about to go on a break. Not going to meet for a few weeks. And I want you to change some things about your life. I want you to stop playing games. I want you to get serious about this relationship with Jesus. I want you to start talking to him. I want you to carve out some time every single day and prioritize him. And, and even when you're doing the other things that you do, you're prioritizing him in your mind. You're thinking that he's sending you to places, the places that you're going to work and the conversations and the meetings and the classrooms, that, that God's sending you there. And what he wants from you most is he wants a relationship. He cares for you. And he wants you to cast your anxieties on him. What does that mean? You talk to him about what you're concerned about. Let me give you a picture. Of my, I've got a son, five-year-old, Weston. He's a good boy. We're sitting in the living room. He's sitting by the fire. It was cold the other day in Dallas. And, and um, we've got a fire going. And he's sitting by it on the hearth, you know, the stone hearth there. And, and I'm sitting on the couch. And, and he says in his five-year-old way, he says, Daddy. I'm like, yes, yeah, buddy. I'd like to talk with you. It's like, okay, man. But I get the sense like this is something serious, like not just monster trucks and remote control cars. Like he wants to chat. And so, so he's sitting there, and so I come and sit on the other side of the fireplace just like him. And so we're both kind of sitting there toes to toes, you know, just like this. I'm like, what's up, buddy? I'm looking at him. I'm like, what's up, buddy? And I'm like, talk to me. And he's like, Daddy, I just don't know why I do what I do. I'm like, what did you do, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and he's like, Daddy, it's like my mind, like these things come to my mind, and, and the, the things that I want to do, I don't do, but the things that I don't want to do, these things I keep on doing. And, uh, and for those of you that, that know the Bible, that's Romans 7, he's preaching. And, uh, 
He's just preaching at me, and I'm like, well, buddy, and this is what I say. And he's just struggling. Dude's tears in his eyes. I'm tormented right now. And, uh, and I said, well, buddy, that's why you have me. I said, man, I'll help you to know what to do, and you can ask me, and when you've done something that you shouldn't have done, you can come to me. And as much as I'm able, I'll make it right. And if I'm not able to make it right, then, then you'll come with me, and we'll go in it together, and we'll say, man, look what we did, and I'll help you. And I'll do that for the rest of your life. That's really my commitment to you. If, if you don't know what is right and what is wrong, I'll, I'll tell you. And, and if you've done wrong, if you've done the wrong thing, you can come to me and I'll do everything I can to help you out of that wrong thing and to point you back to the right way. That's my commitment to you. And he says, Daddy, I'm really glad we had this talk. I said, me too, buddy. I mean, melt my heart, right? I said, I said, hey, you're a good boy. He said, you're a good daddy. I know, that's what I said. I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. And, um, and it was just the sweetest thing. And here's what I thought after that. I'm like, that's what God wants from me. Do you see just the, the humility there? Hey, like, God, hey, can we talk? Daddy. I mean, the, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that you tell me not to do, those things I keep doing, I keep going back to her, I keep looking at that, I keep clicking on that, I, I call him again. I want that, that list of ten commandments, I've broken all of them. I need your help. From this moment forward, can you... Can you convict me ever so severely in the situation that I would always choose right. And when I've chosen wrong, will you help me, will you remind me to come to you that, that you can make it right even when I've chosen wrong, that, that you can show me a way out of that. May that mark your break. Lots of conversations like that. It's a huge act of faith. It's probably the most productive, no, it, it is the most productive thing that you can do. It, it allows God to remind you that he can handle your problems and how can he remind you if he doesn't have the opportunity to remind you if you're not going to him with your problems, if you're not going to him with your anxiety. See, anxiety, when it drives you to prayer, is a gift. Anxiety that pushes you to God, that is a gift gift, but anxiety that distracts you from God, it is a curse. It is the enemy's playpen. It's where he's jacking with you, and he'll keep jacking with you, because he loves to distract you from God. It's his goal. And so we'll summarize, or we'll, we'll wrap up, rather, with the exhortation, the admonishment to wear humility. He says, clothe yourself in humility. It's how he starts. Clothe yourself in humility, that, that we're his, that we belong to God, therefore we have a new uniform. We've got new team colors. We've got something else to wear. Salvation actually starts with humility, right? Because salvation starts with you coming to a place saying, hey, God, I can't. I need help. Uh, right? We're, we're looking at the Ten Commandments in the Thou Shall series, and it's like I've broken that one, I've broken that one. The law, the only thing, listen closely, the only thing the law can do is show you that you can't keep the law. That's Romans 8. And if you see that you can't keep the law, then you realize you need someone to save you from yourself. That's Jesus. That's the power of the gospel. God doesn't expect you to keep the law. He expects you to realize that you can't keep the law so that you come to a place so that you realize that you need a savior. And do you know that a savior's job description is saving? Jesus is really, really, really good at moving toward people in their time of need. He's the best at it. And so you come to a place where you say, God, I need help. That's a place of humility. And that's where salvation starts. And in that moment, you have new clothes to wear. Those are the clothes of humility, that you would clothe yourself in humility. What does that mean? That means that when somebody looks at you, they don't see somebody peacocking. They don't see someone rolling around saying, hey, look at me. I'm the big man on campus. You know, I'm Mr. Dallas, Mr. Fort Worth. I'm Mr. H-Town. No, they see somebody. They say, I'm a servant of the king. I don't need you to like me. I don't need you to think more of me. I don't need more trinkets and treasures. I serve the king. All the trinkets and treasures are his. I just carry his chair. 
I'll sit at his throne. I'm a servant. So you clothe yourself in humility. What that tells me, guys, and consider this, that tells me that humility is something you actively put on, that it doesn't naturally happen, that pride naturally happens. In the flesh, pride will consume you, but you have to work, you have to do something to put on humility. And so consider when it's cold outside. Remember when you were little, it's cold outside, and your mom's like, hey, you need to put on a coat. Why do I need to put on a coat? Because it's cold outside, and if you don't put on a coat, you're gonna be cold. Now, picture yourself at the beach. There's no clouds in the sky. The sun's at high noon. It's coming down hot. It's 127 degrees in Texas, and there you are. And somebody says, hey, you better put on some sunscreen. Because if you don't put on sunscreen, you're going to get burned. And what Peter's telling us, what the Holy Spirit is telling us through his servant Peter, is that we've got to put on humility or else we are standing in a position to the most powerful force in the universe. And that ain't gonna go well for us. And so we put on humility. What does this look like practically? Every day you've got things to do. You've got meetings every day. Some of you got a Microsoft Outlook calendar that kind of tells you where you need to go and when. And so I've got a friend, one of the most godly men I know, and every day he wakes up, and in the same way that I wake up and I think about, okay, what do I have today? You know, I'm teaching at the porch. What am I gonna wear? You know, um, I, I don't have any meetings. Hey, it's casual Friday. I'm, I'm wear athletic shorts. Like you think about what you're going to wear based on what you have to do. And so every day, my friend, he wakes up, he looks at his appointments, and he looks at the meetings like, oh, man, I'm gonna have to really wear some humility to that one. You know what I mean? Like, she annoys me, so... Uh, I'm not pointing at you. I'm, I'm, I'm pointing at imaginary. <laughs> she annoys me, you know? <laughs> and, and, so, and so, like, for that one, I'm gonna have to really put on some humility. Oh, man, when I go home for Christmas, that, that, okay, that one, I'm gonna have to really wear some humility. When I go to that meeting, oh, when I, oh, I've got my funnel review. Oh, I've got that appointment with the boss, appointment with the principal. Oh, when I meet with those parents, oh, I'm gonna have to really wear humility to that one, and you consciously think about it, and you humble yourself under God's mighty hand, and you clothe yourself in humility. Because what it says, think about what it says. It says, and God will exalt you. God will lift you up. God will take care of you. And I wanna say something really important here. Those are not expectations. They're explanations. Do you see what I'm saying? Because if you say, well, I'm gonna leave here, and I'm gonna be humble so that God can exalt me, that's being prideful. It doesn't work that way. You say, hey, I'm gonna leave here and I'm gonna be humble because God is God and I'm a servant. And then what he does as an explanation for that person who's truly humble, he lifts up, he exalts. So you don't be humble to be exalted. You be humble because you understand who God is. And so we're dressing up in humility. Like I said, my friend literally uh, plans out his day based on wh where he needs to wear humility. And, and to say something in a different way, it's, it's Peter saying, hey, humility looks good on everyone. Okay, it's that little black dress you can wear to the funeral and the wedding and on the date. You know, humility is that button-down shirt that, that you told your friends is illegal in 48 states because you look so good in it. Like, that, that's, that is humility, right? So you, you wear that. You put it on just like that shirt. And I want you to know, and we'll wrap up with this idea, is that you're not the only one wearing this uniform. You're not the only one wearing this uniform. See, it says, resist him standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And this is an important aspect of humility. The humble, humble people know that they are tempted just like everyone else. All the other people who are wearing the same kind of uniform. And so maybe you're sitting there and moments ago you're like, man, how does he talk about pornography so freely? I can't even say the word. And like he just talks about like, really, gosh, that prayer was graphic, wow. I mean, here's how. Because I know you struggle just like I do guys and girls alike, all over the planet Earth. 
we struggle in the same ways. And when you start saying, no, 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 you don't get it, man. You hadn't been where I'm at. You hadn't struggled with this kind of depression that I have or, or this anxiety. It's unique to me. Or, hey, bro, what do you know about same-sex attraction? You hadn't walked in my shoes. You don't know what it's like. What you want me to be celibate my entire life? You've taken a position of pride. Can I tell you something? See, what happens is when I get done preaching up here, as I stand up here, and then what happens is you guys come up and you want to chat. And then what happens is, is the same thing every single week is, is somebody comes up, they look over, and I don't mean, I'm not trying to be disrespectful in this. I'm just saying what happens. They look over their shoulders, like, hey, man, can I talk to you? Hey, do you, you mind if we come over here? I'm like, no, you can talk to me right here. What's up? What's going on? Oh, man, I just like, I just, you know, I'm, I struggle with same-sex attraction, bro, and just like, no, there's no other Christians who, who do that, and I'm just by myself, and I'm the only one. And then, and then we pray, and we talk, and we pray, and hopefully say something helpful, and then he leaves or she leaves, and somebody else comes up, and hey, man, you mind if I talk to you over here? What's up, man? Talk to me right here. What's up? Man, I just struggle with same-sex attraction. I'm the only one here. Like, no, you're not. See that guy over there? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I don't do that. I don't do that. But it's every week. And, and listen, I, I picked on one thing. Let me go with another, okay? I picked on one story. Let me go with another. Hey, my, my struggle is the same as yours. Well, what do you mean? Oh, oh, pornography. Yeah, do you mind? Can I talk to you? No, it's good. You're good. Talk to me right here. What's up? I want to help. Man, I'm just really struggling with porn. How do you access pornography? I'm at my phone, bro. My phone. Where's your phone right now? It's in my pocket. You're not struggling. You're carrying the lion around with you in your pocket. You, you, you hadn't started struggling. You're just feeding. You're not fighting. What do, you, what do you want me to do? Get rid of my phone? Sure. Yes, in a word. What am I? You know, I'm supposed to have a flip phone? Yeah, why not? <laughs> Get you a flip phone. Get you a razor. Remember those things? They were cool. <laughs> you know? Everybody had a razor. Get you a razor. You won't have to look at porn. You can't look at porn on a razor. It's all grainy, you know, that's not cool. <laughs> Here's what I mean, okay? I think I ruffled some feathers on that last one, so let me just, just hear me out on this, okay? I know that Peter's writing to the persecuted church. He's writing at a time when Christians are literally fed to lions. I get that. And I think the way that the verse applies to the church today in a time of abundance where we can worship freely and raise our hands and bring our Bibles in public, um, it, it can apply to temptation in the same way that 1 Corinthians 10.13 does. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says this, uh, no temptation has seized you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Here's what he's saying. God will never put you in a cage with a lion and lock the door. If he ever puts you in a cage with a lion, he's going to give you a key. He's going to show you a way out. He's going to put a bright red exit sign up saying, hey, come this way. Don't jack with that lion. Don't feed that lion. You come with me. I've got something better for you. And so your situation is not unique. You are tempted just like millions of other people are tempted. And you can stand firm in the same way that Jesus in the garden stand firm, stood firm. Peter stood firm. The apostle Paul stood firm. The, the saints that have gone before you for centuries and centuries and centuries have stood firm. You too can stand firm. You do not ever for the rest of your life have to sin ever never happen. That you will always have a choice to make. I can feed my flesh. I can feed the lion. I can come in the opposition of God or I can humble myself and walk out the door and get out of the cage. I can move on. I can choose something better. And you say, man, but you don't understand. Like, Life of celibacy, man, that's terrifying. It is for a little while. And then you go to heaven. And then it's not. 
And so you say, well, what do I do? Let me ask you this. Is there anything you could do today to pursue God more? Do that. Do that. And the God of all grace, verse 10, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. You see, he's, he says he'll make you strong, firm, and steadfast. He will help you carry the chairs. He will help you carry the weight of life. You don't have to do it on your own. That when you humble yourself, God, the, the strongest being in the history of history, will come beside you and help you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And then he ends in worship to him. Be the power forever and ever. Amen. And I love that idea that that earthly humility leads to eternal worship. See, you don't need to be king here. You need to know the king here. You can stop going through this life saying, hey, look at me and, and how many followers do I have and how many likes did I get and, and I want people to love me and to know me and to like me. You just go through life saying, hey, I know the king and I'm loved by him. And you're a road sign. You're a road sign pointing to King Jesus. That's your role. You know those guys that that whenever there's a king, like in those movies where there's a bunch of guys like carrying the throne, walking down the street, like holding them up, you, you've seen that in, in a, that's your role. You carry the king's chair. For the rest of your days, that's your role. Embrace that. Like sometimes humility starts with just embracing obscurity. I'm okay if I'm not known. I'll preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. I'm okay if you don't like me. I want to tell you the truth with grace. I want to point you to Jesus. I want to show you the way. You need to be okay if they don't like you. You need to be okay if you're alone like Noah, building an ark like a crazy man. Like you just embrace obscurity. It's all right. You're going to die like everybody else has died. And if you've trusted in Christ, you're going to go be with him forever. And your obscurity down here won't matter there. I'm moving toward Christmas. When my son prays, the same little boy prays. <laughs> he says, and he always says the same thing. He says, God, and thank you that we get presents on your birthday. And I love it. it's just an observation that he made himself, that, that God's a generous God and that on his birthday we get presents. And, and it's the paradox of faith, that on his death we get life. That when he loses his life, we get eternal security. We get eternal life. That, that when he dies, our sins are for given that when he endures the wrath of God, we get freedom from that. That is his funeral, we receive salvation. I think that God loves a humble heart because God has a humble heart. And we see that humble heart just in the way that when he came here, he came here to serve us. Even with his life and even in his death, he came here to serve us. And so in summary, pride brings opposition. God helps the humble. And I encourage you to wear humility. I don't know if you guys saw that uh, Prince Harry is engaged. You guys see this? If you've been on a computer, you've seen that. Um, and then there's, you know, the other guy. What's his name? Oh, yeah, William. And, uh, and Kate. And they're pregnant. Do you see this? Having a royal baby, their third child. Just think about this for a minute. We'll wrap up here. Think about the care that that little baby's going to get. Royal child. Best doctors in the whole world. Like in the, in the most amazing delivery room that your mind can possibly fathom. The softest sheets. You know, the, the most incredible pajamas, like their pajamas cost more than my car, that, that little baby's pajamas. And, um, and, and, and everybody's going to be fighting, like the media's going to be fighting over who can cover the birth of that child. And contrast that with the humility of God. 
that when God came here 2017 years ago in an event that reset the calendar, he came to a town that you would have never heard of. It's like a, like a suburb of Van, <laughs> like Lindale, like that's where he came, Bethlehem. You would, have never, you would have never heard of Bethlehem except Jesus was born there. And when he, when he came, you know, the, the God who created the entire world couldn't find a room to be born in. There was no room. And so he went in a cave. It was a cave. I've been in the cave. You know, supposedly the cave he was born in. I've been in it. And, and it's where they kept animals. That when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was born here, the, the shouts of, it's a boy, were covered with the sounds of animals. And the delivery room was filled with the stench of animal feces. That, that was him. And where they put him, they didn't know where to put him, so they set him in a feeding trough, a place where literally donkeys and cows just had their noses to eat. And they set him down in there, the King of Kings, the one who formed you in your mother's womb, the, the one who all things were created by him and for him, the supremacy belongs to him, the fullness of the deity dwelled in him, that God here, crying. And as soon as he was born, kings wanted to kill him. This little baby caused such a commotion, and he would die. He would die but only after he lived a perfect life, a life you can't live. And he died because you can't live it. He endured the wrath of God. The most innocent person that has ever been died for your pornography and for your materialism and for your identity struggles and for your identity in singleness or marriage or, or wanting things, your covetousness, the, the, all of the, your adultery, your fornication, the, your drunkenness went on him. And so this Christmas, I want you to spend this season the way Peter ends in worship. I want you to worship him with your all. That's what we're going to do tonight. We're just going to end the year in worship. And, and, and I don't want a prideful worship. I want you to get lost in worship, a humble worship. It's you and God, just you and God. You sing to him like you would as if you saw the Savior of the world in the manger. I want you to sing like that. Watch this with me. <laughs> 